I've been wanting to do this video for quite some time, but it seems like a pretty big mountain to climb because Gurdjieff looms so huge over the last century of spirituality. And part of me has felt like I might be very much missing out by not seriously diving into his fourth way and making that a key part of my own practice instead of me just reading about him over the years. Because he, this Armenian trickster is such a fascinating cat. Uh, how he's interacted with people, how he set up his uh, institutes, and <laughs> how he scammed Russian military. Um, his stuff over the years, the anecdotes of both his power and his wisdom are really intriguing. And so this is a series of three short lectures that's free on Internet Archive. And I'm going to go through my notes about Gurdjieff. But the question this Bennett guy is asking is, did Gurdjieff bring something brand new to the spiritual table? Which is quite rare. Most teachers are rehashing the old, which is fine. But Gurdjieff might have been doing something brand new. And this was a very illuminating little uh, set of lectures about what was so special about Gurdjieff. And what you have to remember is, he started off in Central Asia. And so his early life was quite hard, and that seemed to have marked him forever. But also, Central Asia, he would have been exposed to so many mystical traditions there. There are so many that run through that region, which is a crossroads region. Lots of invasions, but also lots of uh, types of mysticism coming through. And apparently, even from early on, he saw humans not as evil or dangerous or harmful. He saw us as helpless as buffeted by forces we don't understand and not able to control ourselves amidst them. He also had seemingly some level of psychic powers, and he early on learned not to use them too much because they impinge on the will of others, and it's too easy to use that kind of thing. So he also had a very uh, depthful knowledge of hypnotism, which even of itself can feel like a superpower. So one of his first questions was, how can humans be making so little use of these mystical traditions and falling to forces so alien to their nature. So he started diving in and learning from all of them that he could find. First there in Central Asia, then apparently Ethiopia became very important to him. It seems like uh, he learned something there. But Central Asia was really the key source of his ideas. There seems to be a very small sect called Ali i Haq, which this uh, lecturer found one obscure reference in one obscure book, but seems to be the secret that Gurdjieff didn't want to reveal. But this uh, brotherhood known as the People of the Truth spread, or spread from like West Persia into Kurdistan, and it seems like it's where he learned much of his uh, great secrets. But he was drawing on traditions from the Eastern uh, Christian Church as well, and their focus on resurrection and death. And as far east as Tibet, where he worked very hard at learning the Tibetan language, and I'm sure the Tibetan wisdom. So one of the things that Gurdjieff learned that was so important is the transformation of energies. And some people use the alchemical lens to view that, but he was good at seeing these energies inside of yourself and realizing how hard and how much work it would take to transform them, but that is the great work. He had said, if you want to participate in the resurrection, you must have a resurrection body. And it takes a lot of work to transform yourself to have a resurrection body. And maybe two items to explain some of the things you hear about his character. Um, for one, he learned from the Nash the Nakshabandi Dervish Order, which was an order that prided itself on their secrecy as well as leading normal lives. And you might meet a tailor. Um, and so these would be great mystical masters who knew each other, but they would lead very normal lives. Um, and every, one of their tricks was every member would tell you that they are the main member. They are the head of the order. So there is no head to the order because everyone tells the outsiders that they are the head. Um, and Gurdjieff would have loved that kind of trickiness. But this lecture, Bennett, also mentioned something to help explain some of those more negative anecdotes you hear about Gurdjieff. Because there's a lot of him being a jerk, of being really hard on people. And you're like, is he just one of these guys who says nice things but isn't a kind person, really? Because um, that happens all the time. Um, but Bennett, the lecturer, talks about the way of Malamat, which is a disguise of putting yourself in a bad light. When you are 
at this extremely high level and you don't want to be taken for a messiah or be worshipped. You want to pass on what you're trying to teach but not get too many hangers on like an Osho kind of thing where it just gets too much. Um, you practice being kind of a jerk to people and the smart ones can see through it but other people can't and they just think you're a jerk. So you are putting on this fabric to protect yourself from feeling or being seen as too messianic but uh, bringing in the adherents who get it, that that's just part of the game that you play. So Gurdjieff learned from all of these traditions and realized what he needed to do was to make a new system for right now that drew on all those old mystical systems because he saw the growing human problem with this technological age to be suggestibility, that these outside forces are controlling us much more than we realize. So he began his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. And it took off. He had a number of adherents up in Russia, up to the Tsar, he was palling around with. And it said that he was trying to counteract Rasputin. He had a number of uh, high-level followers um, across from Russia to the United States. And really, he was trying to translate this wisdom of Central Asia to the West about how to overcome human defects. So Gurdjieff used all this to craft his fourth way and spread it greatly throughout his lifetime, had many adherents against the many troubles of money and personalities and uh, politics and revolutions that occurred during his lifetime. He kept pushing forward. And this uh, lecture, Bennett, was quite poetic um, on how many systems like this have failed and that he hopes Gurdjieff's will move forward. There are still a lot of Gurdjieff adherents and circles around the world, but it will be seen if that's still happening in a, another generation or two. But Gurdjieff saw that in modern times, we must be part of life and not withdraw from it. It's not the time for us to be monks. It is a time for us to be involved in the work as artisans and as workers trying to better ourselves and better the world. And I'll end with two quotes from Bennett talking about the fourth way. Having introduced the notion of the fourth way, I must refer to another important feature, namely that it has no permanent form, no permanent place, no center. It is constantly searching and adapting itself. It does so not for the purpose of improving its own content, but for the purpose of performing a task. There is a certain work, means capitalized, to be done in the world. And in order to do that work, some people must come to the rest requisite understanding. And lastly, the notion of the fourth way is wholly bound up with these two principles. The first is that of complete involvement in life externally, and secondly, in the acceptance internally of responsibility for certain work that is required for a greater cosmic purpose.